Okay, good morning, everyone. Hazak Baruch, thank you for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday morning as we are studying together Perashat Korah. Today's class is Le'elu Nishmat Esther Miriam Bat Beri Ruach Anurat Anihena Began Eden Hi Vechol Benot Yisrael Shukhavot Ima Bechlar Ami Vaseichot Vechini Yiratzon V'Nomar Amen Sponsored by her husband Abe, uh, Hedaya, and uh, children and grandchildren. Today's class is also for the Refuah Shilema of all of Am Yisrael. Amen. Rabotai, our Perasha Korah, is a perasha that we study, uh, and it's a perasha that bothers us. Vayikah Korah, the perasha begins with a man by the name of Korah. Who was Korah? Korah was Moshe Rabbeinu's first cousin. Okay, if you want to just make a quick family tree right here, just to make sure we get it right. Korah, who is his father? The pasuk says, Vayikah Korah ben Yitzhar. So Korah is the son of Yitzhar. Who is Yitzhar? Yitzhar is Moshe's uncle, okay? Moshe's father was Amram. He had an uncle, Itar. So Moshe and Korah are first cousins, okay? So what about this guy, Korah? He gets up and he starts challenging Moshe's authority. Who are you? Who put you in charge? You're a nobody. Aharon, who put him in charge? And he charges and accuses Moshe with nepotism, Okay? The word nepotism, by the way, comes from the Latin nepote. Nepote means nephew, because it used to be that the Pope, when he was appointed to be the Pope, he would hire uh, and appoint his nephew and give him things uh, of position and status and money, of course. And therefore, the word nepotism comes from that word. And he basically, Korah here, again, he accuses Moshe Rabbeinu of uh, nepotism of trying to hoard all the power for him and his brother who put you in charge and he comes out and he starts fighting against Moshe Rabbeinu he's got to be out of his mind but this is Korah okay this is Korah now Korah was successful till this point he had a lot of money he had a lot of fame he was a he was a Levi so that also makes him in charge of the Aaron he's carrying things so he's very high up there but the Pasuk tells us, Vayikah Korah. Korah comes and he takes, what did he take exactly? It doesn't say what he took. Vayikah Korah, it's a little bit uh, uh, ambiguous, the sentence. It's a what we call in English a sentence fragment. Vayikah, he says he took. It doesn't say what he took. Okay? Now we know why he took. He was very jealous, like we just said. He was very jealous of Moshe being in charge and his brother Aharon being in charge, and then his younger cousin was appointed to be in charge of something else. So everyone's given stuff except for me, and all of the jealousy gets to his head, and he can't take it anymore. But take a look, my friends, at what our rabbis tell us. Let us quickly turn to the uh, beginning of our perasha, as we open it up right here. Chapter, no, it's not going to be chapter 13, that was last week's perasha. Let us um, let us go to chapter sixteen. Vayikah Korah ben Yitzhar ben Kehat ben Levi. So here Korah, the son of Yitzhar, the son of Kehat, the son of Levi, he brings along Datan va'aviram bene Eliav ve'on ben Pelet ben Reuven. These are people that were always troublemakers. Datan va'aviram. He brings them along, and this other guy On vayakumu lufne Moshe. They get up against Moses. How much people did he have altogether? Hamishim umatayim. 250 important people. Vayikahalu al Moshe v'laharon. They rise up against Moses and Aaron. Vayomeru alahim. And they say to them, Rav lachem, hajet. You guys have too much power. Kol ha'eda kulam kedoshim. We're all holy. Umadu'a titna se'u al kel Adonai. Who made you guys holier than the rest of us? We turn over here to Rashi, and Rashi tells us something very, very interesting. Rashi tells us <clears throat> Let us, uh, I just want to open the, the source. It's not fully brought down over here. Okay, so this is um, going to be found in the Midrash. Midrash Rabbah. The Midrash says, 
What is written right before this um, episode? Right before this episode of Korah, what was the last week's perasha, Shelach? Right before, it speaks about the mitzvah of tzitzit. Take a look. Hilbishan talitot. Rashi tells us, Moshe Rabbeinu brought 250 men and he put them ta talit shekulan techelet. Full with blue. Okay, imagine an entire blue robe, a nice blue robe. He put 250 men with blue robes. He had a lot of money, so he afforded it. They all come and stand in front of Moses. Amrulo, they say to him, Talit shekulashil techelet. If you have an entire blue robe, Moshe, do you have to put tzitzit on it? We know tzitzit, you put on the corner of your shirt. We put three, three strings white, and then one of them is blue. Okay, so altogether four strings, and then you put them double, so it's eight. So he says, if I have an entire blue robe, does it need tzitzit? Amar lehem He says, of course, it needs, yes. <laughs> they start laughing at him. They say to Moshe, look at you, you fool. If you have a white robe, one blue string is enough to exempt the whole robe. One blue string, you don't need it. You don't need any more. So if here the whole robe is blue, why do I need tzitzit? This is Korah's argument. I want to read it to you from the Midrash. Amar le Moshe, talit shekulat echelet. Mahu sheye putura mina tzitzit. If you have an entire robe of blue, does it need these tzitzit on the corners? Amar lo, he said, yes, it does. He says, I don't understand, Moshe. Talit shekulat echelet. If the whole robe is blue, it's not enough. So one blue string will be enough now? What kind of nonsense is this? And he continues. He says, Moshe, let me ask you another question. Bayit males farim. If I have a room filled with Torahs, entire room filled with Torah, uh, Sefer Torah, do I need mezuzah on the door? Amar lo He says, yes, it needs a mezuzah. <laughs> he starts laughing at Moshe again. He says, I don't understand. The whole Torah is in this room. And it's not enough. Now one small paragraph on the door, if a small, uh, one piece of the Torah is now good, what's it going to do? How is one piece of Torah better than the whole Torah that's in the room? And again, they started laughing. Now, where does the Midrash get this from? That Moshe's argument is on tzitzit, is on mezuzah. Well, tzitzit we know. Tzitzit, we just said, the perasha right before talks about tzitzit. If you go up one pasuk, it talks about the mitzvah of tzitzit. So when our perasha begins and says, Vayikah Korah, and Korah took, we asked, what did he take? It doesn't say what he took. The Midrash answers the question. It took the tzitzit that we just spoke about. So Vayikah Korah, he took those tzitzit, and he put them on the 250 men, and he comes in front of Moshe with this uh, argument, trying to make a fool and a clown out of Moshe. But where does it say, where did he get the mezuzah from? Where does the Midrash get this, that he took a mezuzah, and he also argued on Moshe in, relation, in matters related to mezuzah? So the answer is, uh, if you just fast forward a few psukim, uh, the pasuk tells us that after the Moshe Rabbeinu tries to calm them down, it says that they each came and stood petach aholehem. They stood in front of their tents. What does that have to do with anything? Petach aholehem. They stood in front of the tents. So the midrash learns from those words. Pasuk uh, twenty-seven. Vedatan va'aviram yatzu nitzavim petach aholehem. They came out and they stood at the opening of their tent. Ah, must be. What do you put at the opening of your tent? You put a mezuzah. That's what's in the front of your door, right? In front of your house. So here, here we have now, we understand where the Midrash got what it said from. The only question is, what exactly was Korah's point? Okay, Moshe. Okay, Korah. Good question. I hear. You found a, you found a flaw in, in the system. You found a hole. You saw that there's a certain inconsistency. You found something that logically doesn't make sense. But there's a lot of things that logically don't make sense in Judaism. 
I mean, the laws of kosher. You can't have kosher, not kosher, because it's not healthy. If I was Korach, I would come and say, Ah, Moshe, let me ask you a question. Could I have pig? Moshe would say, no. Why not? It's not healthy? Could I have schnitzel? Yeah, you could have schnitzel. Ah, schnitzel is much less healthy than pig. Ah, Moshe, I found an inconsistency. Ah, the whole Torah must be fake. Right? He doesn't ask from schnitzel. He doesn't ask from fatty, uh, you know, um, uh, what, you know, what's it called? Latkes. You know, oh, how come you're allowed to have latkes? It's not a, you know, there's a lot of, you're right. I'm sure if we sat down, pen to paper, we could find a lot of inconsistencies in Judaism. But, something of the year specific about these two items. What was Moshe, what was Korah's point to Moshe? By bringing up Tzitzit. By bringing up Mezuzah. What was he trying to get at anyways? Says Rabenu Bahia something very powerful. Korah, after all, what does he want? Korah is upset. Right? He's upset, bottom line, why am I not the leader? He wanted to be the leader. Or a leader. Okay, so the main leader, Moshe, he's older than me. Respect. Kohen Gadol, Aharon, also respect, he's older than me. But now when you're putting head of the family, of the tribe of Levi, I should be in charge. Instead, you gave it to his youngest cousin, Elit Safan. If you're going in age, I'm next in line. I'm third, says Korah. It's not fair. You skid me. So Korah now here, he wants to be the leader or a leader. He's very jealous. So he comes and he now has to tell this whole thing to Moshe. So what does he say? He says, you know, Moshe, when is a leader needed? A leader is only needed when the people are on a low level. When the people are on a low level, you need a leader. You need someone in charge to lead them, to guide them. But when the whole nation is holy, when everyone's a leader, you don't need Moshe. You don't need Aharon. We're all our own Moshe and Aharon. We could all be our own judge. We don't need somebody to uh, morally obligate us to anything. We could do that on our own. And so what does he do? He brings this mitzvah of tzitzit. What is he bringing tzitzit for? Tzitzit is not just coming to make a, a ridicule of Moshe. His point's not just to say, look, Moshe, there's holes in the Jewish law, in the system. It's much more than that. He's trying, because every system, there's, uh, there's questions. Every, I'm sure if you look through any religion, you'll find things that you're going to say, you're right, there's a good question, I don't know. Every, at the end of the day, everything, every system has questions, and ultimately you need faith. In football, there's laws of football. This is a catch, that's not a catch. Why, if you're going to do that, a catch, why is that not a catch, right? There's always going to be, technically, you can ask questions. Oh, if the clock runs out, it's you, the pole's still in play. But if, right, there's always things, technically, you're right. I don't know why. I don't know why if it bounces fair and then goes foul, if the player was in bounds, if he wasn't in bounds. That's not what Korah's coming to do. Korah's saying the following. He's saying, Moshe, if you have a robe that's white, then yes, you need tzitzit. You need a blue string. You need a leader when the nation's on a low level. But if the whole shirt is blue, when everyone's holy, when everyone's holding on a high level, when everything is techelet, you don't need the blue string anymore. Moshe, we're all holy. We don't need a Moshe anymore. We don't need a leader anymore. We're all kedoshim. Ki kol ha'eda kulam kedoshim. And therefore he challenges Moshe, we don't need you because we're all techelet. You only need tzitzit on a white robe. But when the whole robe is tzitzit, when the whole robe is blue, you don't need techelet anymore. You don't need the tzitzit on the corner. Moshe, if you have a house that's empty, so you need a big rabbi, you need a mezuzah at the door. But when the whole room is filled with Torah, when the, whole, when the people are all religious, who put you in charge? I don't need a rabbi. I don't need a leader. I'm my own rabbi. I'm my own leader. And this is, this is what Korah's argument is to Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, there are a few points of the year that, that are worth uh, mentioning. Okay? By the way, by the way, besides for this 
argument against Moshe, there is something else that these two mitzvot have in common. What does tzitzit and mezuzah have in common? Both of them, the tzitzit and the mezuzah, remind us of Hashem. By the tzitzit it says, Ur item oto uzchartem et mezvot Hashem. When you see it, you will remember all of God's commandments. Allow me to read to you what the Rambam writes in the laws of mezuzah. The Rambam writes, if I can find it, I believe, let's see. I thought it was chapter 10. I don't think so. It's not here. The Rambam writes, when it comes to a mezuzah, here it is. It's in chapter 6, okay? Chapter 6. Chayav Adam leizahel ba mezuzah bepenei shehi hovat hakol tamid. The guy has to be very careful to make sure to put a mezuzah. Baruch Hashem, I think in our community, today, mezuzah is a mezuzah that we all do well. Right? Okay. Sometimes there are exceptions. My friend once was once at the Jude- Judaica store and he saw uh, a lady purchasing um, mezuzah she says to the fellow behind the counter, how much is a mezuzah? He's like, I think, I don't know, whatever he said, $50. She said, what? $50? It's too much. I need like 10 of them. You know what? Just give me one. I'll photocopy it. <laughs> True story. Okay. And this is the lady who pulled up in her uh, Porsche. Okay. But I think for the most part, we're not like that. Baruch Hashem. We, we do mezuzah well. The Rambam writes, V'koz man she'ikanez ve'yetzeh. Whenever you come in or out of the house, you've got Beyhud Hashem Shemo Shalakadosh Baruchu. The goal of Mezuzah is not just to put it up. You know what the Mezuzah's job is? That whenever you leave your house, whenever you walk out of that door and you see that Mezuzah, Yizkor Ahavato to remember how much Hashem loves us. Ve'yeor Mishenatod, we should wake up from our slumber. Ve'shigyotav, and the nonsense that we have sometimes. Wasting our time, behavle azman, with vanity. A person who walks by the mezuzah remembers that this world is temporary. Nothing in this world is forever. The only thing that's forever is Hashem and His His existence. Umiyadu hozer ledato, and right away a person when they meditate on these matters, they are realigned. Now, if, God forbid, I'm walking out of my house to do something that's maybe inappropriate because my family is away on vacation or I'm alone in you know, my house when my rest of my family is up in, uh, you know, in the summer home. A person's walking out of the house to, God forbid, maybe do something that's inappropriate. The mezuzah is there as a reminder. Amru HaChamim, our rabbis tell us, Kol mi sheyesh lo tfilin berosho, anyone that has tfilin, and tzitzit and mezuzah, they will be protected from sin. But again, of course, like the Rambam said, we have to meditate on tefillin. We have to meditate on mezuzah. We have to meditate on the tzitzit. So here we have another similarity between mezuzah and tzitzit. And both of them remind us of God's greatness. Korah is coming and telling Moshe, we don't need you, Moshe, as a reminder. We don't need a leader. We're all holy. Now the irony in, Moshe, in Korah's argument, the funny thing is, is that he didn't even believe that. If Korah believed that, that's one thing. He didn't even believe what he said. Because really, what did he want deep down? He wanted to be the leader. He wanted to, to himself be the leader. So he's telling Moshe, we're all equal. Equal rights. Baloney. You don't believe that for a second. And it's true today. You see it, unfortunately, in politics with so many people that they're saying one thing and I I believe in this and I believe in that. And you look at their personal lives and it's so far from the truth. 
They don't even believe the own things that they're pushing for in the matters of, uh, you know, the, the policy in the, in the world that they're running. Who realizes this? On's wife. What does On's wife say? On's wife, remember On? On was one of the guys that was originally with Korach. But later on, when they all die, On's not there. On gets saved by his wife. Okay, so to all the women out there, shout out to always being the anchor of the house. The, 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 the wife of On, she realizes, she sees the, the, the lies in Korah's arguments. Yeah, we're all equal. Let me ask you, when Korah wins, what's going to happen? You think we're all going to be equal? Not going to be equal. He's going to become the leader. She asks On, what happens if he wins? Korach will be the leader. And if he loses, Moshe will be the leader. So either way, there's going to be a leader. So what's his argument? And this is something that all the time we have to realize. That Korach saying we're all holy. And the Korachs of the world that we live in today. That's the danger with arguing with evil people. They don't, they don't point out what they want. They say a lie. They talk about something else that sounds nice and fluffy. But you can't even fight them because that's not even what they want. You can't argue in their terms. And this is what really Moshe ends up doing. Moshe, he doesn't argue on their terms. He doesn't tell them, well, you know, yeah, we should all be equal. But someone's got, you know, you can't play their game. Because if you're going to try to argue with them in their argument that they're making up, it's a losing argument. They have it all planned out. Moshe, he pierces straight through. Moshe goes straight to the point. And he says to them, he doesn't argue here. This is a facade. This is a charade. This is a joke. He goes straight to what they really want. You guys, bottom line, bikashtim gam kehuna. You guys, you want to be Kohens. Don't lie to us and tell us you don't want leaders. You guys want to be in charge. You don't agree that we're all tzitzit. You don't agree that we're all equal. You guys agree that there's differences. And therefore, he comes out and he exposes Korah. Now, Korah's mistake, mistake number one that we must learn from, is that he thought that at a certain point in life, you're invincible. At a certain level, you become above the law. You rise above temptation. You're no longer in the grasp of Yetzir Hara. Now, our rabbis remind us, Al ta'amin be'atzmecha ad yom mutcha. It doesn't matter if you're korach. It doesn't matter if you're holy. It doesn't matter if you're the biggest tzaddik. At the, at the end of the day, we always need to have someone above us, someone that we answer to. There's no such thing as a person who is above the law. I don't have to answer to nobody. No such thing. There's a checks and balance system. And I have to answer. There has to be somebody that I have transparency to. Nobody is clean from having to show their records to the IRS. Everybody must be transparent. Everybody can fall. And we believe in that in Judaism very, very much. There's no such thing as a leader that is able to say, I'm above halakha, I don't have to answer to you. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, who was in, put in charge of the Mishkan. Now, if you're Moshe, you're Moshe, you're the head guy. But believe it or not, there were people that were challenging Moshe's honesty and integrity. And they were claiming that Moshe maybe stole a little bit. Maybe Moshe took some extra gold. Look at Moshe's uh, cheeks. They're very fat, no? How do you get so fat? Moshe's buying some nice steaks lately, huh? Where do you get all that money from? What did Moshe say? How dare you, you accuse me? I'm the leader. He didn't say that. I'm above, I don't have to answer to you. And Moshe didn't say that. You know what Moshe said? No problem. You're challenging me? You have questions? Here are the records. Here's how much gold was collected. Here are the books. I have nothing to hide. This is what Moshe Rabbeinu said. Nobody, even in Judaism, has the right to be above the law. And, and this is something that we have to realize is very, very important. Korach forgot this. 
Korah said, we're all holy. We don't need a Moshe. We don't need anyone above us. We could trust ourselves. No such thing. No, sir. The Gaon Mevilna did not trust himself. The Gaon Mevilna had weekly lessons with the Magid of Duvna, Rabbi Yaakov Meduvna, making sure he came in and he would give him Musar, he would give him uh, ethics, morality, maybe something that I'm doing wrong, because at the end of the day, we have to realize that we are biased. Hashochad ye'aver chachamim. We are biased to ourselves. We all think that we're righteous. We all think that we mean well. But a lot of times we're mistaken. And we can't see it. We can't detect it in ourselves. We need an outside opinion. We need somebody else. Just because we're great, it doesn't mean that we're above the law. Just because we have status, it doesn't mean that what we do is right. Take as an example the holiday that we just had uh, just a, a few weeks ago. The holiday of Shavuot. Shavuot tells us about a man by the name of Eli Melech. Who is Eli Melech? Eli Melech is a guy who's important. He's powerful. He has uh, status and stature. He is uh, a chashuv guy. A chashuv guy. Right? Um, the pasuk calls him Ifrati. Power. Important. But Eli Melech makes the wrong choices. Eli Melech decides to leave his country in a time of famine to leave his people, to abandon them. He goes out to the plains of Moab. His two sons marry Moabi women, and they eventually all die, the three men. So Elimelech, just because you are big and important, it doesn't put you above the law or above the, the wrong choices. And he makes the wrong choices. Ruth, on the other hand, compare Elimelech now to Ruth, Ruth has nothing. She's a nobody. She doesn't have status. She's negative. She's uh, from Moab. We don't even accept male converts from Moab. But Ruth makes right choice after right choice. And eventually she becomes the matriarch. She's raised to a level where she becomes a queen. The lesson, I think, is very clear. Just because of your name or your position, you're never above the law. Everybody has to answer. Everybody has to constantly check themselves. Am I doing the right things? Coming from nobility doesn't mean that what I do is right. Doing, what, doing what's right will ensure that nobility will come from me. That's Rabbi Bernstein's uh, take on this beautiful Megillat root. But our rabbis told it to us much earlier. Ezehu hacham halomed mikol adam. You know who's a wise man? A wise man is someone who learns from everybody. Being chacham in life means being able to learn from everyone. And the difference, take a look, the difference between a person like Korach and a person like Aharon was that they were both very powerful. But Aharon constantly checked himself. When Aharon was given importance or power, Aharon said to his brother Moshe, I don't know if I'm worthy. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Can you please give me Musar? There has to be something that I could improve. I could always be better. Aharon always felt that he was lacking. Korach always went through life felt feeling that he was perfect. Same difference that happened between Yaakov and Esav. Esav always felt like he was good, like he was big, like he was mature, like he was a tzaddik. And, uh, and uh, Yaakov Avinu always felt like he was small, like he could do better. And the way to grow in life is to always be honest and to have an outside opinion Maybe, maybe I'm biased, Rabbi. Talk to your therapist. Talk to a guru. Someone that could help us. Someone that's going to be honest with us. Unfortunately, you have to be very careful today. Because a lot of people today, especially in the professional fields, they're, um, they have to say certain things or else they get canceled. And um, they're going to not always be honest. But if you get with someone that's honest, doesn't matter. doesn't matter who you are. You're never above the law. Story is told by Rav Chaim Shmuel Levitz that uh, there was once a meeting held by Rav Leib Chasmin. And in the meeting, there was difference of opinions between the rabbis of what should be done. And finally, one old man got up, big rabbi, and he said, Rabotai, you need to listen to me because I know that I am, uh, because of my age, honor is beneath me. I am no longer tempted by honor. And therefore, my opinions and my views are unadulterated. 
They're pure. They're exactly the way the Torah wants me to think. They're not tainted by ego or by honor or by desire. They therefore listen to my opinion. Do what I said. And Rav Leib Chasman got up and said nonsense. Shtuyot. Do not listen to this man. What he said is completely a lie. Nobody is above the temptation of honor. Quite the contrary. The older you get, the less your desire for temptation becomes. And when that desire shrinks, the desire for honor increases and grows. So if anything, the older someone is, the more tempted they are for honor. And therefore, nobody is above uh, scrutiny. We have to realize that. We're all... We all have that temptation for honor and jealousy and kavod. Nobody could say, I'm perfect. Anyone that say, says that is very dangerous. Every single person must know, I could fall at any second to my temptations, to my yetzer hara. Even if I'm korach, even if we're all holy, even if you're all tzitzit, we're all mezuzah, we're all sefer Torahs, we still need that moral compass by the door. We must all have that rabbi, that person that we go to. The Gaon of Vilna had the Magid of Duvna. We all need tzitzit. We all need that one string. Even if we're blue ourselves, we need a blue string that's going to hold us accountable, that we're going to constantly answer up to. We have to constantly do what the book the books write. You know, there's a big mahalokah between Bet and Bet for many years. The Gemara tells us they were arguing, was it worth it for man to be created or not? Bet Shammai says no, because by being created, you can now mess up. Bet Hillel says, yeah, but you could also do good. You could also achieve and accomplish. And they're arguing back and forth. What's better? The potential to, to do good at the risk of failing. And finally, the Gemara says, believe it or not, that Bet Hillel conceded to Bet Shammai. And finally, Bet Hillel said, Better if no one was created. Because the opportunity to fail is much greater than the opportunity to succeed in this world. There's that many holes. But now that we are here, what do you do to walk out clean and, and unscathed? You got to do what's called pishpush and mishmush. You know what's pishpush and mishmush? Pishpush is looking at my sins that I do. Mishmush, not mishmush. Mishmush is the Arabic uh, version of apricot. It's a very yummy food. Mishmush. Mishmush is investigate my good deeds. I have to constantly introspect the bad. And then I have to constantly introspect the good. Because sometimes, like the Yitz, like we said, the Yitzhara will come like a rabbi. And he'll tell you, go to shul, go pray. But really, why is he pushing you to go do those mitzvot? Because it's over there in shul that you're going to talk gossip. It's over there in the class that you're going to start speaking lashon hara. It's over there when you go to the synagogue and you're going to start lying and stealing, etc. So sometimes he pushes us to do mitzvot. And we have to be very, very careful from the good and the bad that we do. From the averot and even the mitzvot. So constantly a person must do pishpush and mishmush. And Aharon, his whole life, he introspected. He went to his brother Aharon, Moshe, tell me, what am I doing wrong? Where can I improve? An employee. Constantly to go to the CEO, to the, uh, to the head of the team. Where can I do better? How can I grow? What can I do? I always, we all need leaders. We all need somebody that we answer to. We can never be above leadership. Even a president must have somebody, even a head of court, even whoever it is. There always has to be a checks and balance system. Let's close with one final beautiful story. One year on Chola Moed, Rav Isser Zalman Meltzer, I don't know if you heard of him, but huge, one of the greatest giants of the previous generation. Rav Isser Zalman Meltzer turns to his student, Rav David Finkel, and he says to him, please give me a pen. I need to write something down. And the student says, Rebbe, Chola Moed. We know that on Chola Moed, it's not just carte blanche. It's not a weekday, you can do whatever you like. Chola Moed is 
as important as Yom Tov. There are leniencies when you're allowed to do work, what you're allowed to write, but it's but barring those exceptions, writing on Cholam Wa'id is as forbidden as writing on Yom Tov. Not allowed to write just for nothing. So the Rebbe said, give me a pen. The student says, maybe the rabbi forgot it's Cholam Wa'id. So he just quickly said, uh, it's, uh, it's Cholam Wa'id, rabbi. And um, the rabbi said, yes, yes, I know it's Cholam Wa'id. But uh, it's very important. Please, please give me a pen. The student now even more curious. What could be what could be so important that the rabbi is asking for a pen again? So he said, uh, Rebbe, you know it's Cholam Wa'ed, and uh, you're not allowed to write unless it's uh, you know very important, Pikuach Nefesh, etc. So the Rebbe said, Yes, yes, I understand, and it's um, it is Pikuach Nefesh. Please bring me a pen. So now the student is you know completely shocked. He has no idea. He says, um, the rabbi says, Lo I didn't forget that today's Cholam Wa'id. But I have to write something. Don't worry, it's not a big, it's not a big thing. Um, it's nothing really, but I have to write it. Well, is it, uh, is it something that you're going to lose money on? Is it, like what's, like the, the student's challenging the rabbi. He says, uh, yeah, listen, for me, it's uh, it's Pikuach Nefesh. I have to write it down. It's not a big deal. Like I said, it's a small matter, but uh, please bring me the pen. He says, Pikuach Nefesh, Rabbi? Like, who's going to die? Like, uh, should I call Hatzalah? <laughs> um, yes, yes, for me, it's Pikuach Nefesh. I have to write it down. But really, like I said, it's not a big deal. So finally, the student, after challenging the rabbi three, four times, what is he going to do? He, the rabbi asked, okay. He brings him a pen, he says, here you go. Rabbi takes, he writes down a sentence, and uh, he, closes, he closes the paper, he folds it up, he puts it in his pocket, and they continue learning. Now the student has no idea what pikuach nefesh is that. What did you just do? I thought you were going to send a letter to some doctor, save someone's life. He wrote a letter, he put it in his pocket. You broke Cholam Oed, Rabbi, how could you do that? Of course, he remained respectful, but the rabbi noticed the concern on his student's face. So he said to him, let me tell you, on Cholam Moed, many people come to visit me. They come to wish me Chag Sameach. People from all walks of life, from all over the country. Now, because of many visitors, many of them are religious and many of them are not. And I come across many people that are sinners. That they're, they come in and I can tell right away, they're very far from Torah. So now, a Jew is coming to me on Cholam Moed, bothering me. I got to stop my learning. And I see all these Jews and sometimes I'm, I'm noticing their flaws. He says, but it's not good to notice their flaws. At the end of the day, this Jew left everything on Cholam Mo'ed. Instead of going on a vacation trip to go to Six Flags, he came to visit the rabbi. The only thing I have now to do is to start noticing their flaws, to start picking up on where they're lacking, to start attacking their, their sore points. That's what I'm supposed to do. Of course not. Guy came to my house for a bracha on Chola Moed. I got to remind myself that all of these people are doing their best, that they're righteous. The Pasuk says in Mishle, Enecha lenocha yabitu, yashiru negdecha. And he said, he quoted the author of Netivot HaMishpat, Rabbi Yaakov Melisa, who said the following interpretation. Teva bnei Adam, it's human nature. Lehakiru lerot esronotav shel azulat. Human nature is to see the flaw in other people. You see somebody else who's dishonest. They're so dishonest. They're so rude. They lie. They're mean. Shame on them. And us, I'm a tzaddik. Me, I never lie. Me, I'm the nicest person. Me. I'm Hashem's gift to the world. The other people around me, they're rude. They're mean. They're liars. They're cheaters. I'm tzaddik. That's how, that's how the world is. Every one of us, myself included, we're all like that. Says the pasuk, When you see someone in front of you, with your eyes, when you see a flaw in somebody that's opposite you, 
You know what you need to do? Miyad, right away. yashiru negdecha. Turn that flaw that you see and apply it inwards. Hitbonen az Introspect on yourself. If you see somebody else that is dishonest, before yelling at them, you thief, you liar, we right away must turn the finger inward and say, maybe I'm also lying. Maybe I could be a little bit more honest. Before I accuse someone else of being mean or selfish, maybe I must first ask myself, am I being selfless? Am I giving enough? Am I doing enough? The moment I start pointing, the moment the second in life you catch yourself looking outwards to other people and noticing their flaws, immediately take a mirror, put it in front of your face. Maybe it's me that I should fix these things. It is the Baal Shem Tov that said that the world is a mirror. When Hashem allows us to see flaws in others, it's only to see the flaw in ourselves. Because everyone's ways are just in their eyes, says King Solomon, the wisest and richest of all men. Everyone thinks they are perfect. If you're on the left, you think you're perfect. If you're on the right, you think you're perfect. If you're in between, you think you're perfect. Everybody thinks their views are perfect. Everyone. Everyone thinks their choices are perfect. Everyone thinks that they're, what they're doing is perfect. No one thinks they're wrong. Says the Baal Shem Tov, when we see flaws in other people, it's a moment that we must try to be honest and say to ourselves, maybe that's me. Said, says Rav Isra Zalman Meltzer, when people come in front of me on Chola Mu'ed and I see flaws, that's very bad. I'm not supposed to see flaws in other people. I must quickly adjust my vision, adjust my focus, and see the good in other people. And then I must see the bad. Maybe that is in me. If I see someone coming who's not learning enough, I must ask myself, maybe I'm seeing this person not learning enough, and that's really my flaw. Maybe I'm not learning enough. Maybe I'm not doing enough. Maybe I'm dozing off in my prayer. And so I quickly wrote this pasuk on a piece of paper. This pasuk from Mishle, from Solomon the Wise, from Shlomo HaMelech. Enecha lenocha yabitu. That our eyes, when we see outside flaws, to quickly channel it inwards. For me, my students, this is a matter of pikuach nefesh. This was so important for him that he was willing to write it on Chol HaMoet. You see, my friends, Nobody is above scrutiny. Nobody is above the law. Everybody at the end of the day must be honest and ask themselves, maybe I need to introspect. Maybe there's something that I'm not doing right over here. From time to time, it's very good for you to go to your rabbi, for you to go to your mentor, for you to go to your guru, somebody in your life and say, Rabbi, what can I fix? How can I do better today? What should I start working on this week? It's hard. We don't, we don't like to think that we need to improve, but we all do. Even as a professional, an athlete must go to the... Uh, he has coaches telling him where to improve. A uh, speaker. How can I improve my speaking? Uh, uh, you know, if you're, a, if you're a lawyer, if you're a businessman, if you're a salesman, whatever it is that you do, how can I sell better? What am I not doing enough? To constantly be reading books, to constantly be reminding ourselves, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm being a little bit too lenient with myself. Korah's argument to Moshe, we're all leaders. We don't need a leader. We don't have to introspect. We're all tzitzit. We're all blue. We don't need tzitzit on the corners when you're all blue. I don't need a mezuzah at my door. I don't need a security guard. I don't need to answer to someone when the whole Torah is filled. My whole room is filled with Torah scrolls. That's Korach, but that's not Moshe. At the end of the day, even the biggest leader needs a leader. Even the biggest Sadiq needs a Sadiq. We all need tzitzit. Even Techelet needs tzitzit. Everybody needs to have that person that they, that they answer to. That person that can guide us, that can be honest with us. Again, be a spouse. 
Really, it should be a friend. The problem is today, we don't have friends like this. Today, our friends are fake, are very shallow. If we're going to go to our friends and tell them our deepest secrets, it's going to be on uh, SY Alerts tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we don't know who we could trust. It's going to be spread all over. It's going to be to send to the whole world to hear about, and uh, we're going to be uh, exposed. We don't have real friends like that. So we have to be very careful um, to always make sure that we're on the balls of our feet. Constantly going, checking ourselves weekly. Constantly. Even daily. The more the better. Pishpush and mishmush. This way, this way we'll always be able to know that we're going in the right path. Even if we're a little bit off, we'll quickly go back on. Al ta'amin ba'atzmecha ad yom motcha. Till the day that we die, we can never trust ourselves. The biggest rabbi, Rabbi Ishmael Kohen Gadol, biggest rabbi in the Gemara's time, 80 year old man, and he went off the path. 80 year old man. No one is guaranteed, nobody is uh, proof, no one's protected from evil, from falling. Every single person has it. Every single person needs to constantly remind themselves that we're people, that we're, that we're fallible, and to always have that person that we could turn to in our lifetime that will always be honest with us and guide us, and this way we'll always be able to remain Aharon's, to remain Moshe, to remain truly Kedoshim. Okay, we'll stop over here. Have a wonderful day. God willing, we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.